Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for your word. It is the truth, and we do receive it this night, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it, be doers of it, and we will see it come forth and bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We are sharing with you on the subject of spiritual growth. We've talked about understanding spiritual growth. We've talked about how God wants you to grow, to increase, and to multiply greatly in your life. And we've pointed out from the scriptures the fact that he wants us to increase greatly. We see in Job 8, verse 7, Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. We should greatly increase. That's what he expects of every one of us. And that's exactly what God will accomplish in our life through the Word of God as we are doers of it. Now remember that when we get born again, just a few a couple scriptures that we've looked at, just we get born again, you are brand new babe in Christ. First Peter 2.2, 2, newborn babes, this is the, like one who's just been born. What are we to do? Desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby, because the Word is what is going to cause you to grow up. So you should have a desire or longing for, strong desire for the Word of God, to get in the Word, to study the Word, to learn the ways of the Word of God. And then as we begin to learn the Word of God, we must begin to do it. We saw in Hebrews chapter 5 that the next stage that we see in the Word is when they came to the place of being babies, the Greek word nepios, which refers to an infant. This is one who's now a young infant that's on milk. And it says, everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a baby. How do we come out of the baby stage and grow up? Not just because you've been a Christian for many years, or even because you've heard the word. It's what you do with the word. The word unskillful here means inexperienced. If you are not experienced in the word of righteousness, and how do you get experienced in anything? Hearing and doing it. Hearing and doing it and applying it in your life. That's the way you will grow up, and you will come out of the state of being on milk. And you grow up to walk in the ways of the Lord and see God begin to bring forth fruit in your life. We also talked about over in 1 John, about how we come to the place of being a spiritual youth from God's perspective. 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. I write unto you fathers because you've known him that's from the beginning. I write unto you young men. The young men is this word neaniskos in the Greek, which means like a young man or a youth, spiritual young man or youth. What makes a person having come to this point in their spiritual walk? Because you have overcome, which means to conquer and carry off the victory of the, over the wicked one. You have not come to this level if you have not conquered and carried off the victory over the wicked one. God expects us to do this. And he goes on in the next part, he says, I write unto you little children, because you've known the Father. As you grow up, you'll get a revelation of who the Father is and how he works in your life. Then we come to verse 14, and he's talking about these young men again, where I've written unto you fathers, because you've known him this from the beginning. I've written unto you young men, the ones that are spiritually young men, the ones that conquer and carry off the victory. How have they got to that place? Because you are strong. This is the word iskros, which means strong and mighty and having force, mighty force. How do you get to that place? Because you have the word abiding in you. The word abiding in you, because you have put on the whole armor of God, you have the word in you, you brought forth fruit, you've gone through the cleansing process to bring forth more fruit, and you come to the place where the word's abiding in you to bring forth much fruit. And you have overcome the wicked one. In other words, you're not at a level of spiritual youth unless you've overcome the enemy in all these areas of your life. Most Christians are growing up towards this. God wants us to engage in the warfare and to conquer all the enemies in our life and carry off the victory. And then, of course, we're going to grow up on into spiritual manhood or womanhood and go on into perfection in the Lord. We talked about a lot of important principles, and we are talking about the increase and the abounding in your life tonight. We began talking about this at just at the end 
when we were finishing up on Sunday evening. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. He says, The Lord make you to increase and abound. You see this about increasing, and you see it about abounding throughout the Word of God, especially many times in the New Testament. He wants you to increase and abound, overflow in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Because you have fruit and more fruit, much fruit, continual fruit, you should be increasing and abounding and walking in love towards every single person. And we talked about the commandment in the New Testament is that we love God as well as we're also to love one another. And that your love is to abound continually, more and more, as you walk in the ways of the Lord. Another one that we looked at the last time was about increasing in brotherly love. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Indeed, you do it toward all the brethren that are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. God wants you to be on the increase in everything that you do in life. It's not like just get to some point and then just quit. <coughs> you are to be increasing, <coughs> increasing continually. Otherwise, you're never going to plateau. You're going to keep, keep going up, increasing, abounding more and more in your life. And that's what he wants us to get this understanding. Tonight we're going to continue off in this point. So we're talking about increasing and abounding. The next point is to increase in knowledge. God wants you to be increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. God wants you filled with it. Not just have a little bit here and there. He wants you filled with the knowledge of His will. In all wisdom, spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, as you have the knowledge of God and understanding wisdom. You're going to be fruitful in every good work, not just once in a while, but in everything, and increasing in the knowledge of God. <coughs> God wants us increasing in the knowledge of God. So we're going to continue in it. We're going to grow in it. We're going to develop in it. We see this also discussed over in 2 Peter. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 1, <coughs> excuse me, verse 8. <clears throat> it says, For if these things be in you and abound, God wants all these things in you and abounding. <coughs> <clears throat> they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word knowledge is the word epigenosis, which means precise, correct knowledge. So God is saying he wants things in you, but he wants them abounding, overflowing, increasing greatly. If they are, then you won't be barren, you won't be unfruitful. Instead, the knowledge of God will be producing the fruit in your life. And that's what he wants. He that lacks these things, he's blind, cannot see afar off. He's forgotten that he was even purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. And it's interesting, when it says this word, to make, we always look at the tense voice and mood, and especially when there's important things we pointed out to you. This word here is a present tense verb, which means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So you're going to be doing this for an ongoing effect in your life. And it says it's in the middle voice. The middle voice in the Greek means the subject is doing the action for his own benefit. In other words, you are to be diligent to make for your own benefit on an ongoing basis your calling an election, which means to be chosen sure. In other words, it's not set and sure. We know that from the scriptures. Many are called, but only few are chosen. You've got to make for yourself your calling an election Sure. How are you going to do that? For if you do these things, you and I are responsible to do the word. The word do is a present tense verb, ongoing action. Continually do these things, you shall never fall. And what it's been talking back here, which we talked about in the past, but I'll just bring it up again. You're to add to your faith virtue, which is moral excellence, moral goodness, 
to virtue, knowledge, walking in line with the knowledge of God, to knowledge, temperance, which is self-control, that which keeps the flesh under, and to temperance, patience, which is the word hupomone, which means steadfastness, and this is what's in the control of the soul in your patience or steadfastness, same word, you control your soul, you possess your soul, Luke 21, 19. And into patience and godliness, which is the result of you being a hearer and a doer of the word. And to that you add brotherly kindness, brotherly love, and charity, which is love. And then he comes to the place. If these things are in you and abounding, then you're going to be fruitful instead of being barren and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. God wants you to increase in knowledge and do what the Word says so you are making your calling and election sure in your own life. We even see at the end of the chapter, or end of this book, in chapter 3, verse 18, he says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God wants us to be continually growing in knowledge. How are we going to get growing in knowledge? We're going to spend the time in the Word. We're going to be hearing the Word. God wants you to be spending a great amount of time hearing the Word so that you grow in the knowledge of God. And then as you put it in operation, then it will produce fruit in your life and you will be walking in the ways of victory. Another thing that we are to increase and abound in as we grow up spiritually is hope. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. What produces hope? The Scriptures. The patience and comfort of the Scriptures. So what is hope? Hope is a Greek word, elpis, which means a confident expectancy. The Word produces hope, which is a confident expectancy of what God will do for you. As you see the promise of God, it will give you hope for that promise coming to pass. It's not like in our uh, thinking today. Hope it doesn't mean wishful thinking. I hope it'll work out with no confidence. No. Bible hope means confident expectancy. You know it's going to happen. Now the way you bring your hopes into being is with your faith, which we'll be talking about in a moment. But God wants you to get filled with hope because later in the chapter, verse 13, he says this, Now the God of hope, he calls God a God of hope. He's a God of hope, a God of confident expectancy. He wants to fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. Not just barely be holding on to hope and confident expectancy. You should be abounding in it. He's a God of hope. And one of the things that's going to show if you're really abounding in hope is you will be filled with all joy and peace in believing. You won't be down, depressed, worried, anxious, wonder if it's going to work out, wavering, all these kind of things. No. If you're really in hope, you have a confident expectancy of God performing His Word. And if you're really abounding in hope, you're going to be filled with joy and peace as you're believing God's Word. You know that He's going to bring it to pass. He wants you to abound in hope at all times. We see over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15. See, the devil tries to get you to be hopeless. He tries to get you to think it's not going to work. He tries to get you to take away your confident expectancy. You'll never see your faith produce anything if you don't have hope, because again, faith is the substance of things hoped for. You've got to have hope. 2 Corinthians 10, 15, he says, Not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. In other words, what do they have first? They had hope. And then what were they looking for? For their faith to be increased, so that then they would realize the fruit of that, which be they would be enlarged or increased themselves by them according to by our rule abundantly. So God wants you to have hope. And then as you also have your faith increasing and growing by working it, you will see that it will bring the hope in, hopes into manifestation. This brings us to the part about increasing in faith. God wants you to increase in faith. In fact, we see 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, for it's meet that your faith groweth exceedingly. Your faith is to grow exceedingly. I mean, there's no limit to what your faith can grow to. 
It grows as you put it in operation. So he wants your faith to grow. Now, you must understand there's two aspects to faith. First of all, you've got to understand what happened to you when you got born again. When you got born again and you received Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, you got the Spirit of Christ, but you also got the same Spirit of faith. With the Spirit of Christ, you have the Spirit of faith. Notice we all have the same Spirit of faith, just like we all have the same Spirit of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we have in the same Spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believe, therefore by spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. Meaning that what do we do with our spirit of faith? We put it in operation to release it by believing the word and then speaking it forth. We believe it in our heart and then we speak forth to release it. That is through your spirit of faith, which is a general spirit of faith that every believer has. And it's the same spirit of faith. Now, the other aspect of it is the fact that we get specific faith when we hear God's word. Because you have a general spirit of faith, doesn't mean you have faith for every promise. Doesn't mean you have faith for healing, faith for prosperity, faith for deliverance, faith for whatever it might be. No, how do you get specific faith? It's through hearing the word. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. As you hear the word, and the word gets written in your heart, producing faith, and in your mind, producing hope, the word is going to produce that faith within you. And as you hear it on subject after subject after subject, then you get specific faith on every one of these particular areas. <clears throat> now, what do you need to do with it? You get the general spirit of faith when you're born again. You get specific faith by hearing the word. Well, you need to do something with the word that you hear that brings specific faith. And what you do is you mix it with your general spirit of faith by putting it in operation. We see this referred to about what it's talking, how we, what we do, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached. What happens when you hear the word? It gets in your heart, gets in your mind, produces faith, produces hope, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. That means the word that produces faith in your heart, when you hear it, doesn't automatically profit you. Why? You've got to do something with it. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. How do you mix your faith? It's with that general spirit of faith. You believe, and then you speak, or you do, or act upon it. Otherwise, you work your faith through your general spirit of faith upon the specific faith of the word that you got in a particular area of your life. As you do that, then you'll be working your faith, and then the word preached unto you will begin to profit you. <clears throat> you must work your faith. First, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. Wherefore also we always pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith with power. Your faith is to be worked, whether it's doing the works and ministering to other people or working in your own life to produce promises, and it's going to release the power of God that's in the Word. You're going to work your faith with power, and it is going to bring forth promises, and it's going to bring forth the works of God being done. Now, the apostles had an understanding that they needed to do something about their faith, because they said in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Otherwise, they recognized. Our faith isn't doing what you're doing. We need to get our faith in Greece because they will see all these people that were seeing their faith producing victory. Your faith has made you whole. Faith was bringing forth the promises of God and seeing healings and all kinds of great works. Increase our faith. So the Lord told him, how do you cause this faith to increase or to grow in your life? Verse 6, the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, a mustard seed is a little speck. It's not that thing you see in the Christian stores where they got that little yellow thing on like a, a chain or something. All That is not a seed. That is a collection of seeds. You break it open and there's all these little black specks that are all the seeds. It's like a little speck. 
If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, which you have at the very beginning, what do you do? You might say under the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. That's the answer to increase our faith. So what's he telling them? The way you increase your faith is by applying it, by working it, by putting it in operation. He said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, which we all do, work it. How do you work it? By speaking. Speak unto the mountain, speak unto whatever it might be. Put your mouth in operation and command, speak commanding words. And as you are working your faith, that's how your faith will increase and grow and become strong. God wants you to get your mouth in operation and get your faith being put in, in operation to work it continually. Your faith must be worked. Remember what it talks about over in James. In James chapter 2. Many people think they have faith because they believe God's Word. Well, they do in one sense because it did produce faith within them. But then they think that just because I believe God's Word that it ought to automatically come to pass. Not so. You've got to work your faith. James 2.20 Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? It's not doing anything. He goes on and says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works by Works was faith made perfect, or it came to completion and produced results. Your faith is what you need to put in operation. Verse 24, you see how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Just like Rahab the harlot, justified by works when she received the messenger and sent them out another way. She just didn't say, I believe. She had to show it forth by her action. You and I are going to work our faith and that not only puts our faith in operation, so it's not just sitting there dead, but it's operating. At the same time, it'll cause it to grow. God wants your faith to grow. So what do you need? You understand you have a general spirit of faith, but then you need to hear the word, of course, get specific faith. If you don't hear the word, you're not going to have any means to apply your general spirit of faith. So you hear the specific word, then you do what the word says, applying your faith, working your faith, to bring forth that promise into being as you believe and you speak the Word of God. God wants you to have your faith grow. And another aspect of causing your faith to grow is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving knows that the promise has been given unto you and takes hold of it to see it come to pass. Colossians 2.6, As you've therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. We don't just receive him and then sit around and not do anything. No, we walk now in the Lord. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. How do we get established? This means, this Greek word means made firm, made sure, established, set. How? Abounding therein in the faith with thanksgiving. Otherwise, thanksgiving should be coming out of your mouth. You should be thanking him as you are praying a prayer of faith, taking hold of the promises. You should be thanking Him as you're speaking the Word into being your work in your faith. Because thanksgiving shows the promise belongs to you, and it is the application of your faith as you take hold of it in prayer. So they said you're going to be abounding therein in thanksgiving <coughs> if you're going to get established in the faith. And that's what God wants. So God wants us to get increasing our faith and see our faith grow exceedingly and become mighty and, and strong and see tremendous works be done. Another thing, he wants you to increase in walking and pleasing God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, the word ought, in the Greek is actually the word die, which means it's necessary. Strong's concordance says necess excuse me, necessary is binding. And this, is, this word is actually translated must the majority of times. So it's a, it's a covenant strong word saying it's necessary as binding. It, you must do these things. So he's saying as you receive this, how you must walk and to please God. As we walk in line with His Word, that's how we please Him. And we're expected to do that. So that you would abound more and more. 
He wants you to abound more and more in walking and pleasing God, walking in line with His Word, doing all the things that He says. That means we've got to be a God-pleaser. We can't be a man-pleaser. If you're a man-pleaser, you're hindering your development of your walk in, in the Lord and pleasing Him. Galatians 1.10 Paul says, Thou, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. We can't be a man pleaser whatsoever. In fact, Jesus was one who came and didn't please himself. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. We then are strong not to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it's written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. He didn't please himself. That meant he was out ministering to people. You want to be living under the Lord and letting God use you as you minister unto him. We see it also brought up in 1 Thessalonians. If you're going to increase in walking and pleasing God, you're going to do what his word says. 1, Peter, or 1 Thessalonians 2. <coughs> Verse 4, as we're allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. We're to please God by speaking the gospel and witnessing for the Lord wherever we go. We also see that we are to be pleasing God as we engage in spiritual warfare. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. You aren't caught up in all these worldly things. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You and I have been chosen to be soldiers in the army of the Lord, and we are to please him. He wants us to please him in all the things that we do. So, you can't be a man pleaser. The only way you're going to increase is be a God pleaser. It means you're going to have to live unto Him. You can't live unto yourself, and you can't live unto other people. You're going to live unto the Lord and do what He tells you to do, and not be a man pleaser. Another thing that we want to increase and abound in is we're going to increase and abound in trusting the Lord. Trusting the Lord isn't just something, well, I just decide I'm going to trust in the Lord. This is something like I have some attitude. No, it's produced through your walk in trusting Him and developing that as you continually operate as trusting the Lord. Psalms 115, verse 11 says, Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. That shows you one of the keys to trusting the Lord is having the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Fear of the Lord is to beginning of knowledge, beginning of wisdom. Without the fear of the Lord, you won't really trust in Him. Also, it goes on and says, The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless the house of Aaron. Israel, the house of Aaron. He says, We will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. So, those that fear the Lord that are trusting in Him are going to be blessed. And then he says, What's going to happen? The Lord will increase you more and more, you and your children. God wants to increase us. God is a God of increase and causing you to abound and to cause you to multiply. He wants these things to come forth in your life. He wants you to flourish in your Christian life. He wants to increase in everything that you do. In fact, Psalms 92, verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. You're supposed to flourish. You're to grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They grow great, big, and tall, and strong. That's what God wants like of you. He wants you to flourish in your spiritual walk and to grow and become mighty and strong. In fact, this is important because as you grow in the Word, what do you do? You produce fruitfulness, don't you? And fruitfulness is, in, He wants you to increase in fruitfulness. This is so important if you're going to be able to walk in victory against your enemies. Psalms 105, verse 24 says, He increased His people greatly. Now, the increase here, you put the cursor over it, it is the Hebrew word para, which means to bear fruit, to be fruitful. So, in other words, he made his people very fruitful, as Young's brings out the exact translation. 
as you increase and you're fruitful greatly. What's the result of that? It made them stronger than their enemies. That means you're no stronger spiritually than the level of fruit in your life. Many people thought, well, I'm strong just because Jesus is in me automatically. Not so. He's in you to work in you to bring forth increase and development and growth. And you are to grow and increase in all things so you become strong. So the more that you have fruit, which is because of the word in your life, and remember, fruit from the word, as you go through the cleansing process, you bring forth more fruit. As you come to the abiding place, you will bring forth much fruit and be true disciples. Those are the ones that bring a great amount of fruit in their life. That will make you stronger than your enemies. And we pointed this out before, but in light of this, we'll point it out again. Luke chapter 1, verse 80. It talks about John the Baptist here. And it said the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. It was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. He had to get strong first. And when it you know, says grew, this particular word in the Greek tense is what's called an imperfect tense. The imperfect tense is a past tense, but it's ongoing effect of a past tense. Otherwise, the way you would translate this more literally, the, the child was continually growing in the past. And wax strong in spirit. This is the same thing, <clears throat> the imperfect tense, ongoing in the past. So it really would mean that the child was continually growing and was continually becoming strong in spirit. It was a process, wasn't it? It was a work going on in his life to bring him to that place. It wasn't just John the Baptist only. Jesus had to do the very same thing. A lot of people don't understand this. They don't understand that Jesus had to grow up just like everybody else. Luke 2, verse 40. <clears throat> this is speaking about Jesus. We know this because here it's talking about the previous verse, and when they performed all the things, they returned back to their own city, Nazareth. So who's that talking about? Jesus. So what's it say about him? <clears throat> the exact same thing. The child grew. This happens to also be the same tense, imperfect tense, was growing, <clears throat> and waxed strong in spirit, same thing, was becoming strong in spirit and filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was continually upon him. This is, again, the imperfect. He was growing in all these things. <clears throat> God wants you to grow in all these things. Jesus had to grow up. If he had to grow up, you and I have to grow up. Everything that you, in your Christian life, it's going to be the result of continual growth in area after area after area. In fact, <clears throat> we see that Jesus came to the place down in verse 52, it says he increased in wisdom and stature. And again, when it talks about this increased, it's an imperfect tense. It was an ongoing process. Jesus was increasing continually in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The same thing's supposed to happen in your life and in my life. We're supposed to grow and increase in all these things in our life. So, you are going to increase and grow and develop in everything that you do. One of the things that we're supposed to do is build our spiritual house so that we see that we're strong, the enemy will not be able to get to us, and we see how we do that. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Heareth Present tense, meaning this guy was continually hearing the word, not just once in a while, continually, and doing them. This is also the present tense. So what this tells you is the guy was a consistent hearer and doer of the word, applying the word in his life. That's what God wants for every one of us. He's likened to a wise man, which would do what? Build his house on a rock so it would be stable, so it would be strong, so nothing could, you know, storms would not affect it. It says, the rain descended, floods came, winds blew, beat upon the house, it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. <coughs> the foundation was laid, it was established. And when it talks about this foundation, it's interesting. This is what's called a pluperfect tense verb. 
and the Greek. It's not a common one. The pluperfect tense <coughs> is a past tense referring to action having been completed in the past, and that's all it says. It's not relating to the status of, and at the time of speaking. It just says it's been completed in the past. So what that means is when you are a hearer and a doer of the word and built your spiritual house and it's completed, it's a done deal, the enemy won't be able to do anything to you anymore. <laughs> it doesn't matter what attacks come. You will not fall because you will have been founded upon a rock. But how about the guy, the next guy? Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, same thing. He's been hearing the word consistently. Well, that's, that's good, present tense. But he wasn't doing what he was hearing. The word doeth, present tense. He's not doing it. Well, that's a mistake. If you don't do the word you hear, it's not going to be working in your life. You're not applying. He's likened to a foolish man, build his house on a sand. <laughs> What's going to happen to that one? Same rain, rain descended, floods came, winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And this wasn't just all of a sudden a fall, sudden, instantly. The reason you know, because the word was, again, is an imperfect tense verb, meaning it was a continual, ongoing action in the past of him falling. So, a person is not doing a word, even though he might be hearing it, he's still going downhill because he's not doing the word. See, many Christians that have been hearing the word and they're going downhill and wonder, why, why isn't God doing things in my life? Because you're not doing what you hear. And that is so important. If you are going to be fruitful and become strong and walk in victory, you are to increase and abound in hearing and doing the word. It is absolutely essential. And as you're doing it in all areas, you're going to see fruit incre increase. Remember what it talks about in the parable of the sower? It talks about how they fell on the good ground and yielded fruit that sprang up and increased. It produced, increased, brought forth 30, 60, some hundredfold, increased. That's what's supposed to happen in our life. We're supposed to bring forth fruit, more fruit, and much fruit in our life. In fact, the seed operating in your life is like is going to produce just like a seed in the ground. Second Corinthians chapter 9 even shows this principle in verse 10. Now he that minister a seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So as the seed is being sown and you're doing it, applying it, it's going to increase the fruits of your righteousness because what's fruit come from? From hearing and doing the word as you're walking the line with the ways of righteousness. And you're going to see great fruit come forth. God also wants us to increase in wisdom and learning. We saw that Jesus was doing that already in the New Testament. But also in Proverbs 1.5, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. If you're going to be wise, you're going to be hearing the word, you're going to be increasing in learning and seeking after revelation. Man of understanding will attain unto wise counsels. Proverbs 9, over in verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man, he'll be yet wiser. Teach a yet just man, and he will increase in learning. That's what you and I want to be. Always be teachable, always be learning, always be growing in learning and wisdom, knowledge, all these things. It is so important. Some Christians hear a little bit and they think that, oh, I've heard some things, and they, they just kind of end up plateauing or sometimes go nowhere and have things get taken out of their heart. That's a mistake. Anybody that thinks they know anything, they know nothing as they ought yet, as the Word says. <laughs> That's for sure. Matthew chapter 12. Another thing is we need to speak, increase in speaking right words with our mouth. Your mouth is important. Matthew 12, 34. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <laughs> they had all this evil in their heart, so they weren't speaking good things. And then he tells us an important thing. A good man, out of the good treasure. The word treasure is the Greek word thesaurus, where we get our word thesaurus, which is what? A collection of meanings of words, right? So this is talking about collecting something. And it really means to, to collect or lay up something. 
good man, man out of the good collection or depositing and laying up of the heart brings forth good things. So you need to be collecting something in your heart so it'll come out of your mouth and you have laying up good things to come out. What's the good things? The word in your heart. But an evil man out of the evil deposit or collection or what's been laid up in his heart will bring forth evil things. He says every idle word, and this is quite a statement, the word idle means one that is not producing. It means free from labor, leisure, lazy, shunning labor. So from the standpoint of words, it's talking about something that is not performing. Every word that's not performing that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Because what's your mouth for? To release things, to bring things into being. You speak the word to bring things into being, or speak it to have some effect. That's why we gotta watch our words. We can't just be speaking whatever kind of words. Every non-producing word, we're gonna give account thereof on the day of judgment. And then look what he says. By thy words you'll be justified or declared righteous, if they're right words. But thy, by thy words you'll also be condemned or judgment will be pronounced against. That's why we've got to increase in speaking right words. Your words are so important in your life. Some Christians have all oh, words, they don't mean anything. They don't know what they're talking about. Words are carriers. Whatever is deposited in them is what it's carrying and what it's going to be released. Proverbs 8.20, 1820. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. Otherwise, what's coming out of there? And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. We want to be sure that we are speaking the right things. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can release one or the other. We've got to be sure we're releasing the right thing so we see God bring forth what he purposes. Now what happens if you speak wrong words? Proverbs 6, 2. Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken. The word taken actually means captured. You are captured and seized with the words of your mouth by the devil because you give place to him if you speak wrong words. This is why the result, of course, of speaking right words, look what it says in Psalms 45, verse 1 and 2. The latter part of this verse says, My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. It's like a marking stick. It's writing things in the realm of the Spirit, like a skillful scribe. Thou art fair in the children of men. Grace, which would be favorable words, is poured into thy lips, which would be the word of God. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. If we'll just speak the right words, it'll bring the blessings. Remember, we talked about Samuel. None of his words fell to the ground. Remember, we talked about how he grew, several verses where we saw how Samuel grew. And it got to the place where none of his words fell to the ground because he was speaking the right words all the time. They were happening. They were coming to pass. God wants us to get the word in our heart and increase in speaking the right words and decrease in speaking wrong words. Stay away from speaking words that are contrary to the word of God. Watch your mouth. The devil likes to get you to speak wrong things. Do not let it happen. Isaiah 57, verse 19. Look what it says. I create the fruit of the lips. You speak the right words, God will bring things into being. He creates the fruit of the lips if you will speak right words. Your words are important. Another thing that we want to increase in is casting out the demons and getting rid of all the evil spirits out of our life in every area. We see in Leviticus chapter 26, the type from the Old Testament, where they were told to chase, which means to pursue and run after your enemies. Our enemies are the evil spirits that we are to pursue after to cast out. It said they shall fall before you by the sword. What's the sword the type of? The physical sword is a type of the spiritual sword, which is the word coming out of our mouth, spoken word. As you war with your mouth, see, so your enemies are going to fall by the spoken word that you're speaking as you're warring with your mouth. And then he goes on and says, five of you will chase a hundred, hundred of you will put ten thousand to flight, that's a lot of enemies. 
your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. And then he makes an important statement. For I'll have respect unto you, for the one who's chasing after his enemies. I'll make you fruitful. I'll multiply you. That's going to be the result. And establish my covenant with you, which is all these promises coming to pass. He wants you to increase. He wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to be multiplied. God wants to do great things. He's holding nothing back. He wants to bring forth and have showers of blessings coming upon us if we will walk in the ways of the Lord. But we have to get after our enemies. We have to cast out all of the enemies. In Leviticus, or excuse me, in Exodus, Exodus 23, verse 30, talks about how they drove out the enemies out of the land. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee, until thou be increased, which is what? It's the same word para that we saw before, which means to bear fruit. And he's talking about driving out the enemies. So this is a type of us driving out the evil spirits that have come into us from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization. So little by little, he's going to cast them out as you are doing what he says, until you get to the place of being fruitful and inherit the land, which is the promises of God in your life. By the way, it sounds like, oh, I thought God was just going to do what it says here. Well, verse 31 says, And I'll set the bounds from the Red Sea and the Sea of the Philistines, from the desert and the river, and I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand. Yeah, that's all a type of him delivering the devils into our hand as we have authority over them. And thou, that's you and me, shall drive them out from before thee. You look at these two verses together, you understand God has delivered us, delivered us, give us authority over all the devils, and they're all delivered into our hand. We have dominion over them all, and we are to cast them all out. And as we cast them all out, we are going to do it. As we do it, God's doing it. God doesn't do it without our participation. So you need to increase in pursuing your enemies and drive them all out and get rid of them all. We need to get on the offensive, and that is important. He talks about going to possess the land in Deuteronomy 7. He says, When the Lord thy God, in verse 2, shall deliver them before thee, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them. You make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. You destroy them and wipe them all out. Get rid of them all. That's what he wants. He wants you to strive every single enemy out of your life. This brings us to another point. You say, well, I'm involved in attacking my enemies and casting them out. Well, are you making the battle strong enough to really see the effect that you need to? You can't just do, do things at a certain level and think that, well, I'm casting out, so they all should be gone. Well, depending upon what's necessary is what you have to look at. 2 Samuel 11, verse 25. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. What was happening was they were fighting, and they were getting defeated by the enemy. They were not winning the battle. Don't let it displease you. The sword's devouring one as well as the other. So what's he tell them to do? You've got to make the battle more strong and overthrow it. You've got to step up the attack. Like, for instance, if we have cancer cases or people that are terminal situations, we tell them to get after casting out a round-the-clock, all-out attack to drive every one of those spirits out. You just don't play around with things when your life's on the line. You've got to get after them, drive them out. Whatever the situation, we want to make the battle as strong as possible or make it more strong, whatever needs to be done in order to get rid of the enemies in our life. Therefore, you've got to apply your faith and make the battle strong to drive all of the enemies out. People that won't do this, they won't get anywhere. I've watched the people over the years, we've told them what to do, and they don't do it. Give them the scriptures on it, and not because I said it, just give them the scriptures, and they don't do it. Will they get the victory if they don't do it? No. And then they wonder why God hasn't done something. No, we have to be doing what the Word says to cast out all these enemies and make the battle as strong as is necessary to drive them out. And remember, it is a little by little process of doing this. Another thing that we see is God wants you to increase in strength. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 5. A wise man is strong 
Yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. So God wants you to increase in strength. Through having the knowledge of God, having wisdom, you'll produce a strength. You're going to increase strength as you apply the Word of God. You know, this is what happened with Saul, who was, of course, called Paul. Many people just figure that he has had some great anointing, made him mighty and powerful, and that was it. No. Look what it says about him in Acts chapter 9, verse 22. And Saul, this is Paul, increased the more in strength. He increased. He got stronger and stronger. This is the word andunima, which is through the word in us. That's how you put on the whole armor of God, through the word in you, to become strong inwardly. Through the word of God, that's how you're going to become strong. He wants you to increase in spiritual strength. That's, also, of course, why you have to keep the word in your heart by doing it. Remember, the word comes in you. The devil comes immediately to take it out. If you don't do it, he takes it out, and it does not produce the strength in your life. Many people have heard the word, but it gets ripped out because they don't apply it. God wants you to become strong. Saul had to grow up. Just because he was you know, a, a, a taught you know, by the top teachers of the law and he was you know, excelled in, in all the things of the Old Testament law, that meant nothing. He had to get the word of the New Testament in him. Remember, he says, I, I count all this as dung. Hey, I, I'm, I'm running out this race for, you know, looking to grow up and everything and for the surprise the, of the high calling of God in Christ. He had to grow up in all these things himself. And notice, he increased the more in strength. That's what God wants for you. It's not just some special thing that just pops on, you know, some people. No. God wants you to grow up and become very strong through the Word. Here's this, Ephesians 6.10. Finally my, finally, my brethren, be strong in dunamo. Be inwardly empowered in the Lord and in the manifest power. This kratos is a manifest power of His mighty force. Remember, this is the guy who's the young youth. The youth, you remember, who was strong, overcame, the, conquered the enemy, carried off the victory, and was, the Word was abiding in him. And the measure that the Word is abiding in you and been put in operation is the measure of the spiritual strength you have within you. And also keeping it. It's very important that you grow up. And remember, you're conquering, as we saw the Scripture before, just, but just bring it up for a moment by remembrance. This is the one who's the young man. The young man, the one who's the Iskos, Neoniskos. He's the young man because he became Iskaros, strong and mighty. He's got the Word of God abiding in him, and he had overcome. He had conquered the enemy. This word here, conquering, carrying off the victory, is, is in what's called the perfect tense in the Greek. The perfect tense is a past tense, action accomplished in the past, with present results at the time of speaking. Past tense accomplished, present results at the time of speaking, which means... He had overcome the wicked one, and the present results of him overcoming and carrying out the victory were present in his life. Otherwise, hey, he was free, and he was walking in victory. He was walking in that position of having conquered the enemy in his life. That is what God wants for every one of us. Another thing he wants you to do, he wants you to increase in doing the works of God. You're called to do the same works that Jesus did. In fact, let's we'll look over there in John chapter 14 first. John 14, verse 12. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. We're talking about, this greater is really talking about more in quantity, a larger amount. You, I, you and I have a whole life to do things. Some people think, well, we're going to do something more greater than Jesus. Jesus raised the dead. He did every kind of work you can think of. In fact, the Bible even says, if the works that were done, of all he'd done and recorded in all the books, the world couldn't even hold all the books that should be written for all the things he'd done. It was astounding. You think you're going to do greater things than what Jesus, as far as, and as uh, oh, I, mine is better than Jesus ever did. No, it's not talking about that. It's talking about the fact that we're going to be doing this more in quantity. We have an entire lifetime to do the works of God every day. Greater works will you do because I go unto my Father. 
We're going to do greater works. Of course, also, part of this is because he's going to send the Holy Spirit back to us, and we're going to do all the works by the Holy Spirit's power who is going to flow through us as we receive the Holy Spirit. You are to be doing the works of God, and we're to be abounding, increasing in it. 1 Corinthians 15. Remember, you're to live unto him, not unto yourself. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved, be ye steadfast, or this really means become in the Greek. Become is the word here, get am I. Become steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We're to be doing the work of the Lord every day abounding in the work of the Lord in some capacity. Prayer, witnessing, ministering to others, doing whatever in some capacity of doing the works of God, ministering deliverance or healing to people or encouraging them, whatever it might be. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. So as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God wants us to abound in the work of the Lord, to be increasing in it, and to continually have it in operation in our life. Another thing he wants, he wants you to increase in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now you say, well, I haven't been operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, God wants you to start seeking after the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit within you, because if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have at least one gift of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14.1, follow after charity and desire. This word actually means to burn with zeal. For spiritual gifts, you should be burning with zeal. I want these gifts in operation in my life. Don't take this attitude, well, if God wants to do something, he'll do it. <laughs> You're never going to see it happen. You've got to want this. Burn with zeal for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to operate, rather that you may prophesy. He wants us all to, we all could prophesy, the Bible talks about. All can prophesy. Say, that's, that's so. It talk, talks about this in the New Testament here. If you can find that scripture. <clears throat> Verse 31. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. He wants, prophecy is speaking forth in a known language what a, a God is wanting you to speak for edification, exhortation, or comfort to minister to the believers in the midst of assembly in order to minister the things of God. He wants us to be zealous for the gifts of the Spirit. Verse 12, even so, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. These guys were zealous, but they had things out of order. And they were supposed to get things in line to excel in them so it would bring edification. God has put at least one gift of the Holy Spirit in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. Hmm, that's not some select ones. That's every man who's got the Holy Spirit within him. What's the purpose? For you? No. To profit with all, to, pro to be used to profit other people. It's going to be used through you to minister to others, not for you. And then he starts listing them out in verse 8, 9, and 10. And they're listed, actually, they're not in, in the, but if you look at them closely, they're in three categories. I mean, we'll go through it first of all. It says, one's given uh, by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, to another faith, to another gifts of healing. It's actually healings. It's plural. There's different gifts of healings. You might have a gift of healing in one area and someone else might have a gift of healing in another area that operates through them. To another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongue, to another interpretation of tongues. There's three categories basically. There's revelation gifts that reveal something. The word of wisdom, which is a future word. All prophecies are words of wisdom, something that will come to pass. A word of knowledge is a fact in existence now or in the past. Otherwise, someone gives you a word of knowledge. And we've had people in the past that have had this in operation. There's probably some of you that God will use you in this. He wants you to operate in it if you have this gift. You might be sitting there and all of a sudden it comes to your mind 
that someone has a tumor in a particular area of their body. Or you might see a little mini vision and see someone, I see a, a tumor in somebody. Well, what would that be? That would be the Lord showing you there's a tumor in somebody that God wants to heal and get rid of it. And so you, what we've done in the past was when people had that, I had them, after we knew they had words of knowledge, whenever they had one, I had them raise their hand when they, when they had one, and I'd call on them and say, what do they have from the Lord? And they'd tell what their word of knowledge was, and I'd say, who, ha who has this problem? And whoever it was would raise their hand, and we'd minister to them and cast out the spirits or minister to them and see them get set free. That's powerful to words of knowledge. And so also there's discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is where you see or hear in the realm of the spirit. Some people see angels. That's a discerning of spirits. It's an operation. Seeing or people have heard angels. Or I've said people see angels around, uh, walking around and so forth, operating. That's discerning of spirits, hearing or seeing. Also, you can see demons. Let me say this. If you, all you do is see demons all the time and you never see angels, eh, I don't think that's a discerning of spirits. You're probably just seeing a bunch of demons <laughs> that are manifesting. Because it's a certain spirit you should see not only angels, but also uh, demons, but also angels. And also it's to be able to discern spirits in people and know what's in them. That you can help them to get set free, to minister to areas of need. Those are revelation gifts. Power gifts. Gift of faith. It's a supernatural faith. Faith beyond faith. Gifts of a working of miracles. One that talks about the working of miracles. Working is... This word where it's talking about operation of miracles, which is dunamis, operation of powers. Actually, casting out demons is a manifestation of the working of miracles because it is a working of powers. There also can be, though, instantaneous type miraculous works, working of miracles. God will do miraculous instantaneous type works, depending upon the type of gift he might have given you. And then also there's gifts of healings, as we mentioned, plural. You can have, you know, you might have a certain gift in a certain area. You might see people with uh, heart problems get healed. I had do one particular guy, he, got, he saw people who had deaf ears get healed. He just, everybody was praying for that deaf ears, their ears were opened up. He just had a gift of healing and operation. It was supernatural. And God used him to minister to a lot of people in that area, but not in other, all the others. It wasn't that he, had to, he could heal in everything. It was just in a particular area that he had it. And then also there's the vocal gifts. Gift of prophecy, speaking forth. And the purpose for prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. As we see in verse 3, the prophesy can speak unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort or encouragement. And this is you speaking in a known language what God would give you to bring a a word to the congregation to speak to, could be one person, several people, the whole group, whatever it might be. And God wants us to operate in prophecy. And there's also tongues and interpretation. Tongues is where it comes in a supernatural tongue and then it would follow that, there would have to be an interpretation of that tongue, which is a showing forth of what, was being, what God is saying. The reason why you don't see tongues operation in the church most of the time is because what's the purpose for the gift of tongues? Verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Other words, if you have some unbelievers in your midst, there could be a gift of tongues that comes forth with an interpretation. It's going to get their attention by something supernatural going on. While prophesying instead serves those that believe. Most of the things will come forth in prophecy. These are all gifts of the Holy Spirit that God wants us to be zealous for. He wants us to have burn with zeal to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit operate in our life. Another thing that he wants to see us increase in is increase in seeing the building of God come forth in your life to be the holy temple of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, over in verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. That's talking about all of us, but if you're not doing your part of being, building your spiritual house and seeing this building be accomplished, you're not going to grow to be a part of the holy temple. You're going to grow up in all things to be a part of the holy temple of the Lord. God wants you to really seek after the Lord 
to grow in all the things that he has so that you are taking your part as a member of the body of Christ, becoming a part of the holy temple of the Lord. Colossians 2.19 also says, not holding the head from which all the body of joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Otherwise, God brings the increase with the increase of God to the body that are going to cause them because of the nourishment ministered and being knit together. Their problem was they weren't holding fast to the head and seeing this happen. God wants it to happen. If you're holding fast to Him, you will see this and you will see the increase of God come forth in your life and in the entire body of Christ. Another thing He wants, He wants you to increase in joy. One of the things I see in many Christians is they don't have too much joy. That's not good. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Isaiah 29, 19, The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord. Meekness. We need meekness. Meekness is a, a humility it speaks of here, a mildness, a gentleness. We need to be meek. Someone who's that way will increase their joy in the Lord. God wants you to, of course, if you're not rejoicing the Lord, you're not filling yourself up with the Word, what else is going to cause, the course, the, the increase of the joy in your life? It's the Word in you. Because Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found. Yeah, I got in the Word. I did eat them. I mean, I took them in me. If I eat them, I, they came into me. And what was the Word? It was the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. The more the Word's in you, the more you're going to have the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is your strength, your fortified place of protection against the enemy. And you need to increase in joy. We also need to grow in grace. We already saw that scripture. You grow in grace through the Word of God, remember, because it's the Word of His grace. Grow in grace. We're told to grow in grace. You're going to grow in grace through the Word of His grace in your life that you're hearing and doing and putting in operation in your life. <clears throat> you're to increase in everything that God has for you. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, over in verse 7, he's talking here about giving when they were giving to other churches or other people in need. And he speaks over here. He says, Therefore, as you abound in everything, in abounding, increasing, abounding in faith, in utterance, in speech, in learning, speaking right words, knowledge, diligence, your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also, <clears throat> excuse me, where he's talking about the giving where they were supposed to be giving out to others, and that's what they were giving to them, giving to the Lord, uh, giving out to others. Uh, they were proving the sincerity of their love because they were going out and ministering to the people's needs because of the riches of the Lord that came to them, and they were ministering to people's needs. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to give out to others. Give to the poor, you lend to the Lord, He'll give back unto you. You give out to help meet people's needs, as God prospers you, it's so you can abound every good work and be a blessing. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, see, we, we endeavor to do that. In fact, we're involved in giving out to different places. In fact, we're about ready to help, uh, uh, like we helped the people over in Pakistan. There's one group over there, and we got them uh, um, a already got some things for them to help them, a projector for them to be able to show the videos. And they have problems over there with a, uh, um, where the power goes out all the time, which is over foreign countries all the time, you have that problem. And it takes some hours sometimes to go through something because the power goes out. So they need a generator. So they, the generator is going to cost $360, so we're going to be sending that to them this week so that we can help them. We're sending to a church over in Pakistan to help them to be able to get the gospel and not have problems and being able to have the gospel. A generator will be great for them. They'll be able to use that and preach the gospel continually and they're increasing ministry and reaching all the Hindus that are there in Pakistan that are being converted to the Lord. It's tremendous. <clears throat> That's why we want to learn to give out to help minister to others. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God's able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may be able to abound to every good work. Every good work. I want you to let you know, though, all your, you know, I really don't mention much, but 
the, the, all the tithes, offerings, things that you bring in. It not only is administer to all the needs of the church and so forth, but we are sending it out to all over the place. We also support people in Malawi that are going forth and preaching the gospel. We've been doing it for years. And we're about to send some more, some guy out uh, who I was with when I was in Africa before, and he's going to be going to <coughs> another place in Kenya that we were at, Mombasa, on the Indian Ocean. He's going to be going down to Tanzania, Tanz Tanzania, and then he's going to be going over to, to Burundi, and he's going to be going to Rwanda and to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and minister those places, and we're going to help them to, to do, send them forth to do those things and help preach the gospel. God wants you to be involved helping to preach the gospel to other places and reaching out to other people. So he'll give you <clears throat> all sufficiency in all things that you can abound to every good work. That means to be able to have abundance to give out to other places. And that's what he wants. We're going to give out and help other people to preach the gospel. Praise God. Over in Acts, this increasing and abounding in your life. Look what it says in Acts 6, verse 7. The word of God increased. That's what's supposed to happen. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Remember, disciples are not just people who got born again. Disciples, remember, are the ones who have much fruit. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you're a disciple. The guys who, in, who continued the word, then were they disciples, and they knew the truth, and the truth made them free. So this is talking about the Christians that became disciples, not people being converted. And a great number of priests were obedient to the faith. These guys were growing by leaps and bounds through the word of God that was increasing greatly. This is what needs to happen in the church world today. Chapter 9, verse 31. The churches had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and were multiplied. They were being multiplied. See, God wants us to be multiplied in all areas. So we reach out to others. Acts chapter 12, the word's to be growing. Anybody said, you know, I've, I've heard people say, well, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm kind of bored. <laughs> say, you're not tuned in. <laughs> you got something wrong. If you were tuned in, you, I don't have enough time in the day to do all the things that I want to do. Bored? <laughs> That's ridiculous person's not tuned in to the Lord at all. Acts 12, verse 24, the word of God grew. Here, it was speaking again, this was growing, imperfect tense, was growing continually and multiplied. It grew continually in the past, it says, and it was multiplying in the past, continually. I mean, this is tremendous work. This is what was happening in the early church. And remember, they had the glory of God poured out. So what's going to happen? The end time church is going to see the glory of God poured out. They're going to be like this. We're going to be like this. If you're not going to be like this, forget about the glory of God poured out on you. The word of God needs to grow greatly in you and get multiplied greatly in you. And you're going to see God do great things. God wants the church to become so powerful. Acts chapter 19. Remember the things that happened in the book of Acts are going to happen again, happen again in the end time church. Acts 19 verse 20. So mightily and grew the word of God and prevailed. This is the word isko, became strong and mighty. It's God's word in you that does everything. It'll prevail. It'll bring healing. It'll bring deliverance. It'll bring great works. It'll accomplish the freedom and liberty in you and in others as they receive the word. God's Word is going to be operating mightily and forcefully in the end-time church, and it will bring forth great things. We've got to be doing what He says. If we do it, we'll see the great works accomplished. Now, what's going to be the results? The Lord wants you to increase in everything that you do. Of course, if He's increasing in these things, what's it going to, it's going to have an overall effect in your life. Proverbs 9.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy's understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. Long life. Long life for the person who is seeing the Word of God work and bring all these things to pass. Also, what happens? If you're taking hold of the Word, doing the Word, walking in it, being faithful, what happens? 
Proverbs 28, 20. A faithful man abound, shall abound with blessings. He's abounding. It's overflowing. That's those showers of blessings coming on you and just raining on you. That's what God wants. This is the word of God. This isn't something that, well, never will happen. I don't see it happening. It will happen if the conditions are met. God wants to do tremendous things. In fact, you've got to know, God's not holding anything back. If in anything, it's the opposite. He's ready to do more than anything even that you would speak. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that's able to do exceedingly above all that we I tell, make a demand of what's due us, this means. Or think, according to the power that is at work in us, otherwise that we put into operation continually, present tense and middle voice, so that means we're doing the work, that we are working continuously for our benefit in us. God will do exceedingly abundantly above all, beyond all. Don't ever think for a second God's holding back. He'll do more than you think, more than you can even speak into being. God wants to bring great blessings. Look what it says over in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and to obedience sprinkling in the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Not just barely. I'm trying to hold on to peace somewhere here. No, multiplied, tremendous, the things that God will bring forth. See, the church has lost all these things, so they haven't looked at the Word and believed it. 2 Peter 1, 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. How's it going to get there, though? Through the precise, correct knowledge of God. What's been, what's the indictment against the church today? They haven't taught the Word. They haven't preached the word. They've had entertainment services. They've shortened things. They eliminate their Sunday night and Wednesday night services. We can't get anybody to come. <laughs> you know, they have pump me up services. Give a text for, they even teach you in the Bible school, give a text and then go and give a talk. <laughs> it's not, we already told you, showed you out of Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. The preacher is wise. He seeks out and sets in order the many proverbs. He seeks, what am I going to teach? Words of not acceptable words are the words of truth. He's supposed to teach scripture after scripture, point after point, teaching the people knowledge. Well, how can grace and peace be multiplied if you don't even hear the knowledge? And especially if you don't get precise, correct knowledge, it's not going to happen. That's why we've got to hear the word. You've got to be hearing the word of God, and God will work mightily. Great things will happen. You and I will do what he says. Then we're going to see it happen in our life. Remember, he's a performer of the word. Mark 4, even look what it says about the kingdom. You operate in the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God. So the kingdom of God is as if a man should cast seed in the ground. Sleep and rise night and day, seed should spring, grow up, he knoweth not how. He doesn't understand what all is going as I'm operating in authority, but it's working. The earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn of the ear. It's all little by little, isn't it? Growth. That's the way it is. When the fruit's brought forth, immediately puts in the sickle, because the harvest is come. When the fruit's, so here, the harvest has come, and so is, where until we liken the kingdom of God? Or what comparison shall we compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when it's sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. It looks like it's doing nothing. It's hardly anything. But what does it do? When it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow. It becomes great. As you put the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God in operation through the authority that God has given to you, through prayers of authority, intercession is so important to break the powers of darkness and to release the things of God and speak things into being. Of course, one last scripture about that we need to pay attention to, though, you can't let the wrong things abound. We also see in the last days, and you see it happening now, and you're going to see it happen a whole lot more as we go down this road, the abounding of lawlessness. Because anomia, Lawlessness is what the word means in the Greek. Shall abound. 
the love of many shall wax cold. This is talking about the church, agape love. Remember, it talks about the many and the few. We've got to be one of the few, not one of the many. The many are walking the broad way that leads to destruction. The few are walking the straight and narrow way that leads to life. The love of many shall wax cold. What is this? This is the fall away church. They're, they're going to fall away from the Lord because of the abounding of lawlessness. Otherwise, the lawlessness is going to get a hold of them because they're not walking in line with God's word. And of course, we see it happening in the whole world. The world's getting crazier and crazier, and it's going to get a whole lot worse as we go down this road. Th you think it'd get much worse? Oh yeah, it's going to get worse. The lawlessness is going to abound in these last days. That's why you've got to be in the Word and walking in the Word and stay away from all these things or it will capture you. These guys are going to get taken because they get their eyes on that. You've got to be walking in righteousness and having the things of God abound in you. God wants you to increase and abound in everything of the Word of God. As that happens, you will grow, you will become strong, you will be multiplied, and God will accomplish a great work in you. And you will come to the place of being so strong and mighty in the Lord, nothing shall shake you. No enemies will be able to get to you. You'll walk in victory. You'll be stronger than your enemies. And God will bring forth all that he purposes in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for your increase and abounding in my life in all these areas of the Word of God as I hear and do your Word. I thank you. I will be sure to make my calling and my election sure because I'm going to increase and abound in all these things hearing and doing the Word so that I will be established. Nothing will be able to move me. Nothing will be able to shake me. I thank you for your growth, your increase, your multiplication, your abounding that is coming forth in my life. I see all these areas where they increased, they abounded. I'm going to increase and abound. I'm not holding on. I am going forward, upward continually in my spiritual walk. I will get in the Word, hear and do it every day. I will do the works of God. I will war good warfare. I will speak right words. I will do all that you command. And I thank you that I will increase and abound exceedingly in every area of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. That's what is going to happen. That's happened. This will happen in the end time church that's going to be the remnant. The ones that it won't happen, they'll be the fall away group. It's going to be one or the other. You're either going to be in the remnant or you're going to be in the fall away crowd. So make sure you're not going to be in the fall away crowd. You're going to be walking the straight and narrow path. Praise God. One of the few that leads to life. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We will be doers of this word. We will increase and abound. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.